I'm going to do a summary of the videos that I have already recorded uh, in case, as is likely, a lot of people don't have time to look at all of it. I want to focus here mostly on the method that was used to fire Des at Glacier View. I believe the outcome was predetermined. It was stated before Glacier View by a number of top GC men, and there are witnesses to this, that Des was going to be fired at Glacier View. And the outline of what was going to happen was clearly stated in the beginning meeting by Elder Neil Wilson, who presided over all the meetings at Glacier View in 1980. I know a lot more about Glacier View than I say here. Of course, it's very much one viewpoint. Every person there, and there was over a hundred, would have a different viewpoint. And this is mine. I don't go into the details of the doctrinal issues. I don't discuss the October 1979 forum or the pre-meetings of Glacier View or the early days of Glacier View and the week of study. My videos are mainly talking about the comment that Dr. Young made in the 2010 Morissette meetings, the 30th anniversary of Glacier View, the fifth one, where he suggests that the 10-point statement written by six people, I believed on the Thursday, he thought it might be the Tuesday, not sure, was just to inform administrators on the fine points of difference between DES and traditional Adventism. And Norman says it was probably laid to rest before Thursday night. But that was not our experience. On the Friday, when Prexad and the Australasian Division met with Des and me, I wasn't there all the time, but I believe I heard the key points. We believe the 10-point statement was used to fire Des. Des and I both agree on this. The consensus statement, which was the work of the whole group at Glacier View, was only brought up by Des, not by the Brethren. In videos six and seven of my series, I, the, I have a long prelude, but I read out the notes of Elder Spangler and other leaders who wrote up their memories in order for being written up in the ministry in September 1980. And these Friday afternoon meetings, which I was given when I was writing an article in 2007, and I basically used the words of the GC Brethren to say what happened on Friday afternoon. I believe I at least tried to use them fairly. These notes show the content of how Des was disciplined. And even though Elder Parmenter said to me afterwards I shouldn't have said that Des was fired, um, it was only a matter of time and a continuance of what happened and as was let go. I thought he was let go on the Friday afternoon. So some of the points in summary of what Elder Spangler and others notes said. First, Neil Wilson spoke about how brilliant Des was and all his pluses but then he began dismantling him. He said he had poor judgment, that he didn't listen, that he always thought he was right. He was always the teacher, never the learner. Elsewhere in the meetings he was called arrogant, they spoke about his collusion with Bob Brinsmead they also mentioned, particularly Bob Spangler, that Des didn't take any notice in the pre-Glacier View meetings when they wanted him to make changes to his manuscript. 
but the accuse, accusation that Des took things out of context, which meant his scholarship was poor, came from Dr. Arthur Furch. And when he made this accusation, Des said to him, Arthur, show me where I've taken things out of context. And Des said, Arthur gave him nothing. In fact, those pre-meetings of Glacier View, Des said if those meetings, the record, re recordings of them were ever listened to, they would exonerate him because the very few people spoke and what they said was very thin. And I'd remind you that Dennis Porter, a British Adventist who actually lives not far from us now, was an associate li librarian at Oxford Library's Bodleian Library. And he answered this question about Des not being very scholarly and said that his manuscript was very scholarly indeed. Dennis Porter was highly regarded and he knew a lot about handling manuscripts. Second, a lot of time in that Friday afternoon where Des was disciplined was spent on his affiliation with Robert Brinsmead, particularly his collusion with Bob Brinsmead to send out the tapes of the 1979 forum meeting across the world. The figure given to Des by Neil Wilson, which was not in the notes, was 50,000. Des has an excellent memory. That's what he remembers. Well, in 2007, I decided while everybody was still alive and having done a master's in history and understanding historical method, I decided to try and find out who sent out the October 1907 forum tapes. And I found out that the accusation that Des joined in collaboration with Bob Brinsmead to send them out was not true at all. And there was a lot of talk in that Friday afternoon meeting about Des not being willing to separate himself from Brinsmead and say where he didn't agree with him. Well, what was the backstory behind this? We were never told this. We were never told the background before, during or since. Except for a letter from Parmenter, which I didn't see until 2000, when Milton sent it to me, when he made a vague allusion in late 1978, almost a year before Glacier View, that a member of the Brinsmead family had come down and made certain accusations. Well, we were used to accusations. We were used to a lot of lies and a lot of gossip. We saw the humour in it and we just let it go. But we were never told what, the, what was behind these accusations. And the reality was that when Bob Brinsmead came out against 1844, he eventually published his book, 1844 Re-Examined, in July 1979. His brother, John, was very upset with him. And just before Parmenter wrote that lit letter, in about September, October 1978, John had gone down to see Parmenter. And there, <clears throat> there's a record of this in the Divisions Archives, and I've spoken more at length about that elsewhere. And it was John that said that Des was in collusion with Bob, and that Des would be able to say that this was not true, because I, Jill Ford, was the mediator. And none of that was true. It just was not true. So later, because this was a continued consultation, Parmenter used John as an agent or a consultant to find out what Des and Bob were doing, separately and together. And John said that um, Bob had spoken against 1844, Des had done the October 1974 forum, 
then they, after Glacier View, they were going to get together and destroy the church. None of it true. We were never informed about this background, except for that vague allusion in Parmenter's letter. The other thing that John said was that Des was responsible for writing 1844 re-examined. It wasn't true. And when I talked to Bob about it years later, he said Des had nothing to do with that manuscript. Now, when Des listened to me reading these notes from Spangler and others about the Friday afternoon on videos six and seven, he turned to me and said it was all about Brinsmead. Another thing, the third thing, the work of the Glacier View Committee. The two consensus statements put together by the small committees who met every morning and wrote up their findings and these findings were presented by a leader each afternoon and then at the end of the week these were all collated, written up as the consensus statements about Ellen White and the doctrinal position by Bill Johnson, Fritz Guy and Duncan Eber, as I understand it. This was never mentioned in the Friday afternoon. Now you may find that unbelievable, but read those notes. Don't believe me, don't believe Des. Read the Brethren's notes. They read out, or they were going to read out, and Des said, let me read it, the 10 point statement. And what that was, was a group of six out of the more than a hundred were asked to write up the differences between Des's position and traditional Adventism. Not Des versus the Dallas Statement, which had advanced from traditional Adventism. Not Des versus the Consensus Statements, which advanced even more. But Des versus the traditional Adventist position. There were six people in that committee, including Norman. Norm asked Des, he asked Jim Cox, and then he asked Des, should he do it? And Des said, better you than anybody else. Um, and the men who wrote that statement did not know how it was going to be used, and a number of them could not have signed it themselves. That was what was used to fire Des. Now Des, seeing what was happening, that he was going to be fired doctrinally by the Ten Point Statement, said, but the consensus statement supports my case in the Glacier View manuscript in seven crucial points. Possibly more like 11 or 12 points, which figure I've used, but Des said crucially, in crucial points, seven. The brethren didn't believe it. They later stated that this was in Des's mind. See the videos of 2010 Morissette, where the whole jury idea was to judge whether Des told the truth when he said that consensus statement went towards his position in seven to 12 key areas. And then the brethren later wrote an answer and said it was all in Des's mind. Now, if you're looking for material about the doctrinal issues at Glacier View, I lightly touch on them in the early videos. Des answers questions in a 40-minute video and then does another two videos about his belief in Adventism and what Glacier View was about from his perspective. He also did an outstanding talk on Glacier View in 2010. The fifth video... The second sermon of Des is all about Glacier View, if you want information on what it was all about. But in summary, Glacier View is a culmination about the differences between a large group in Adventism who believed in traditional Adventism, the old landmarks that could never be changed, and what Des's opposition called the new theology. This was not 
a phrase of praise. Basically, the new theology is the old, old theology, the old, old story of Jesus and his love and what happens when you take the cross and apply it in principle to prophecy. It changes everything. When you take the platinum, platinum wand of the gospel of righteousness by faith, justification by faith, and you tap the traditional old bones of Seventh-day Adventism, then stand back and watch the resurrection of them bones in Ezekiel 37 and see them dry bones live. Now some people would say, well, Bob Brinsmead went out into a very lukewarm view of Christi Christianity. Some people even think atheism, but I doubt it. But Bob mixed in many churches, and he found that in every church that he went into, you had the hard guard who were only interested in keeping people out by their punctilia insistence on doctrine rather than a focus on Christ. And this was how he reacted. I'm not agreeing with it, but that's what happened. Now, traditional Adventists had been seeking to get Des removed from ministry for at least a decade. The pursuit was long and hard, and we felt it every day in Australia and in America, locally at Avondale and Pacific Union College, and globally. We heard from all over the world. And I touch on this in my early videos, but there's a lot more I could say. Now, Bob Brinsmead began to teach righteousness by faith, particularly in the 1970s, and he possibly expressed it even more clearly than anybody in Adventism. Bob had taught perfectionism and traditional Adventism in an, to an extreme in the 1960s, taking the most traditional views. And people such as the Standish brothers, Colin and Russell, preferred what Bob taught in the early years. Now, Des learnt the gospel of righteousness by faith, in principle, from early ministers in the church, possibly those who came in from outside and knew the gospel better than those inside. He read widely in writers like Spurgeon and others. He learned it from Dr. Edward Heppenstall while studying in the USA. He and his first wife, Gwen, attended Heppenstall's classes to great benefit. He also learned it from Ellen White in passages like First Selective Messages, where Des says what she says about justification by faith is as good as anything you'll find in print. Yes, you can skew Ellen White both ways, but she does talk about the gospel. And she, in her later life, was going more and more towards a focus on Jesus. Now, much of Des's education was on the subject of prophecy. His second PhD was in eschatology. He probably studied more about the issues of prophetic interpretation than anybody in the church. Through the years, he spoke to a number of scholars. Cottrell, Ivan Blazon, many others, who believed that Adventism had problems with their date setting. A lot of their interpretations were not correct. When I first came into the church, there was a lot of talk about Turkey being the king of the north. The point is that Des was not alone in seeing these changes these needed changes in Adventism, but he was probably the one that was most publicly disciplined. Now, when Bob wrote 1844 Reexamined in summer 1979, at the same time, Des was writing his commentary on the book of Revelation, Crisis, while he was at PUC. He was given three months off to do it. 
Des went to the Library of Congress. He handled many books that use historicist principles. Some of them were very ancient, hundreds of years old. And he saw and knew that in each period of history, Christians had applied the book of Revelation to their own times and believed they were... believe they were living in the last days as they understood it and because these principles repeat to some extent they were right Martin Luther believed that he was preaching the three angel angels messages Adventists just did the same thing putting all the last day events as happening in the 19th century but time passes interpretations are found to be inaccurate. Historical dates are found not to represent what really happened. And reinterpretation is called for. And what Des was trying to do was to take the principles of the cross and apply them to the book of Revelation. But of course he was misunderstood. Now the forum at PUC asked Des to take a meeting about Bob Brinsmead's book. Wherever Des went, he was asked questions about it. Des said it would cause trouble. The leaders of the forum said he would be protected under spectrum. That turned out not to be true. And everybody thought only 150 or 200 people would come. And it was planned to be in a small room, the music hall, Paul and Hall. And over a thousand people came. And I'll never forget standing outside Paulin Hall, watching a thousand people run up the steps in the middle of the campus to Irwin Hall. It was a heady experience. It was very exciting. I'll never forget it. Now, many received the talk positively. And Eric Syme, Dr. Eric Syme, was asked to respond to Des. And he said that he believed what Des was saying. Nobody ever mentions that. But traditional people sent the tape to General Conference and the right wing had waited for this moment and when Des spoke on 1844, they saw it as Des delivering himself into their hands. Now Glacier View resulted in Des losing his job and his credentials and three years later in 1983, Pastor Parmenter asked GC to take away the ordination of Des and also to call him apostate. And meetings were set up in San Francisco. Um, and this was stated in the review. His ordination was taken away and he was called apostate. And the same happened to Smuts Van Royen because he was an American minister that had credentials and he was working at Good News Unlimited at the time. So he lost his ordination um, and also was called apostate like Des. And I tell that story in video five in the last half. And in my recitation, you can see the way the administration determine ahead of time what they're going to do. They allow discussion People are consulted, they give their opinion, they think they're being heard. But then the administration completely disregard the view of the participants and they execute what they planned right from the beginning. It happened at Glacier View. It happened in 1983. It's happened with women's ordination, which is still ongoing, which is one reason why I'm doing these videos at this time and also I should mention IBMTE look up articles about it on Spectrum where the church is trying to restrict ministers and teachers beginning at the colleges but it will go through our schools workers are going to have to sign a contract that they will not talk to the people about any questions that they have they won't talk to their peers you should be worried. This is how the church behaves. 
Now, on video seven of mine, when I'm reading out the notes, the brethren kindly recorded what I said. I cried from the beginning of the meeting, probably before. I cried in my room when I left. I cried till the end of the meeting. And of course, as a woman, as soon as you cry, it weakens your position. So I'm not crying now. But if they hadn't recorded it, I probably would have forgotten most of what I said. I'm proud I spoke up. But my friends, if I was, if Glacier View Friday afternoon was today, knowing what I now know, what would I say? This is what I, some of what I'd say. Number one, Elder Wilson, have I got it right? Tell me. Did you plan to fire Des before the meetings were held? Top leaders said it before Glacier View. It's been recorded. A taxi driver friend of ours who used to take GC men to the airport, he heard leaders in the back saying the same thing, that Des was going to be fire. So did you plan it? Whatever the outcome during the week, did you plan to fire Des? Second, Elder Wilson, at the beginning of the meetings, you stated that Dallas General Conference and the 27 Fundamentals were set up as a benchmark. That's my words, because it's a long time ago, it's 37 years, and I won't have it exactly, but I think I've got the gist of it. So the Dallas Statement, the 27 Fundamentals, were set up as a benchmark from which we would not digress. Is this true? Now, Elder Parmenter, we were told three years later that you came over with a, with a demand that Des be dealt with that week. Elder Spangler and Duncan Eva apologised to us three years after Glacier View in the 1983 meetings in San Francisco. There are witnesses, Smuts Van Royen, Calvin Edwards, Noel Mason, and a number of men from the division. They heard you say it, and that administration at GC would have had more meetings and would have negotiated. Now, Elder Parmenter, what pressure did the right-wing Conservatives put on you in Australia before you came? that you felt you had to make this demand when you came, that Des be fired this week. What did they have on you, Elder Parmenter? Elder Wilson. Now this has got nothing to do with you or your son. This is not your fault. But why did your father have to leave the Australasian division under a cloud. Why were those who knew about it asked to remain silent? And people might say, well, this is a, a nasty blow, but it is pertinent because your father, Elder Wilson, was promoted and he became the North American Division President. And he created a dynasty and has had two sons that have been GC Presidents, and both of them have done their best to halt progress in the Church, to punish those who taught the Gospel and tried to bring life and salvation to Adventism. That's why it's important. Why is it, Elder Wilson, that both Elder Parmenter and your father 
continued up the ladder of promotion, rewarded for their transgressions. Why does the church cover up and keep silent about the wrong behaviour of their ministers? And how could you, in these meetings, bully and humiliate Des, a servant of Christ, a person of the highest personal moral rectitude, known for his love for his enemies? How could you? And Elder Wilson, an Elder Parmenter, why have you ignored the consensus of the group? Why did you use the 10-point statement? Is it because you knew you could not fire Des on the basis of fact? Because the consensus went his way. The consensus was an advance on Dallas, and they were both an advance on traditional Adventism. Why did you ignore the consensus on the Friday afternoon? Des saw the way the wind was blowing. They gave him the ten-point statement. They were going to read it out to him. He said, give it to me to read and it will take me less time. He corrected what they said about the year day principle. They said it was a very fair statement between him and traditional Adventism. But the Dallas statement and the consensus statement were advanced on the 10 point statement. So basically, the brethren ignored the consensus statement. They used the 10 point statement to fire Des. Is this correct, Elder Wilson? Elder Parmenter, why did you not reveal to us the background of the Bob Brinsmead accusations? Why did I have to find out from the other side? Some of it took me 27 years to find out. You used Des's poor judgment and his association with Bob Brinsmead to fire Des because you couldn't fire him over the facts. Elder Wilson, why did you lie about the distribution of the tapes? We knew nothing about it, but you said it and we believed it. You were the General Conference President. We believed you. And Elder Wilson and all of you who met at that meeting on Friday afternoon, why was all the gossip, all the lies, all the nastiness, all the devilishness of some of Des's enemies not mentioned or acknowledged in that Friday afternoon. Why did you accuse him using some of their accusations, which were mean-spirited and without ground? Why? A correction before I finished. I said Oxford Libraries, Bodleian Library, I meant Oxford University's Bodleian Library. Also, when I talked about the Wilson formula for meetings such as Glacier View in 1980, the post Glacier Views in 1983, Women's Ordination and IBMTE, I missed out one factor, so I will repeat it. The administration decide ahead what they are going to do. They call a convocation, a meeting. People from all sides give their opinion. They feel listened to. They feel there is a ju just process. 
then a consensus statement is written from all sides. Then the brethren write another statement written by the few with the original intent and the brethren use this latter statement to enforce what they intended to do all along. When I spoke in the section about what I would say to Prexad and the Australasian division in the latter half of the talk, I spoke to Elder Parmenter about his not revealing the background about John Brinsmead and his false accusations. I did not specifically mention the accusation about the 50,000 tapes that Des and Bob supposedly colluded together to send across the world, which turned out not to be true. See video 4, where I detail this. I also missed out my comment, comment Elders Wilson and Parmenter, how could you accuse Des of colluding with Bob Brinsmead when you had been colluding with his brother John? Now I really went to town doing nearly a dozen tapes on this subject. Only a historian or the truly serious would listen to it. And it all came from the comment of Dr Norman Young in Morisset 2000, who said the ten-point statement was just a list created by the six participants to show the administration where Des differed from traditional Adventism and was shelved by Thursday night. This was not true from our viewpoint. Both Norm, Dr Norm Young and Bill, Dr Bill Johnson have felt that Des did something wrong at Glacier View. They didn't like his manner or attitude, I don't fully understand it. This despite essentially believing the same on the book of Hebrews. And out of all the people at Glacier View, all of Des's enemies, I've been most upset with Norm and Bill because they never really defended Des, at least on a personal level. I would like to remind you that many ministers in the church tell us that the investigation, the investigative judgment is virtually dead in the church. It's not taught. Bill Johnson told our daughter Elaine two or three years ago that it's a horrible doctrine and it's not taught in America. But nobody will say this. Nobody will speak up because of fear that it will all come up again and they will lose their job. Bill's recent book, which Des has read and I haven't seen, sees San Antonio Great um, General Conference as the church's watershed. He doesn't mention Glacier View. He doesn't mention the investigative judgment, though he has a wonderful cross-centred view of the future of the church. I ask you the question, my friends, if Des hadn't spoken out so clearly on the issue of the investigative judgment, who would have had, who has had since, the courage to speak out? So many people know that Des was right and they won't or can't say it. Finally, I called this video The Masters of Sleight of Hand. Those magicians. And I was speaking about the politicians who so cunningly crafted Des's exit. It's taken a lot of reflection over years to understand fully what happened though many people knew it instinctively at the time. Now Jim Cox and Fred Veltman both spoke to Neil Wilson and said they believed like Des did the week of Glacier View. Neil Wilson's response to Fred Veltman was, that's all right, just don't talk about it. Now what do you think of that? Neil Wilson knew exactly what he was doing at Glacier View. It had nothing to do with the truth. 
I think it's important to keep a record, and this is why I've done these vi videos. Des and I attend church. We love the people. You may not believe it, but we're not bitter about what happened. We understood it. The church had a problem, and this is how they dealt with it. The Lord has blessed us amazingly, and we've had incredible support over the years in promoting the gospel. Des never had to ask for money, but thanks to the Lord and to our blessed Saviour, who has taken care of us over the years, and thanks to the many friends who have helped us. God bless you.